All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for, um, for attending uh, this afternoon's session. I wanted to just spend a little bit of time uh, talking through a major transformation that Cisco has been undergoing over the last six months. Um, we're kind of at the beginning of the journey, and so there's, there's a lot of information in here that, um, you know, we obviously haven't learned all the lessons yet, but as we go through this journey, we're learning a lot of lessons, and I want to kind of share some of those um, with everyone. And so just kind of an outline of, of what I'm going to be speaking to. Um, I want to kind of talk a little about what's happened in the last six months at Cisco, the transformation we've been going under. Um, explain what I mean by application-centric. Um, you're probably thinking that it's a trick, right? A, a networking company like Cisco talking about applications, but it's, I'll kind of explain what I mean by application-centric. Uh, talk a little bit about the intercloud. Um, it was announced at uh, the Cisco Partner Summit about a month ago that we're building this intercloud, and so I'll explain a little bit about what that is, how that fits into the journey we've been on, and then kind of wrap up specifically on what we're doing within OpenStack and, and how we're contributing to the OpenStack projects. And so at the beginning of our journey um, was a little bit different um, than you might have would expect it, right? And so Cisco has been looking at, you know, has been supporting cloud and been in cloud providers and enterprises doing private clouds for, for some time, you know, a couple to three years now, uh, create reference architectures, and many of you may have even developed or deployed um, your cloud on a Cisco reference architecture. And so, um, but as we looked at what was happening within the industry, it became very apparent to Cisco that if they didn't change their big box mentality and start looking more at how to deliver things as a service, then it was going to be a different company in several years. And Cisco and the environment that Cisco was in may be a lot different for them, and they may not succeed or be successful in that new environment. And so we wanted to kind of create this sense of urgency. And so when you want to create a sense of urgency, and this is important for all of you in, in, in the business side of, of your corporations trying to make a transformation to a cloud, um, the first thing you have to do is kind of realize that it's not just about the technology. Everyone here probably loves technology like I do, um, but it's really more about um, the people and the processes around what you do every day, right? And so in order to kind of change from the direction you're going in a certain, you know, you're going down a certain path with your application development, you're going down a certain path with how you manage and run infrastructure, um, what cloud is doing is kind of changing all of that and to kind of get a sense of urgency around the need for that change, um, you have to look at how you're doing your organization and how your organization is set up to support cloud services and cloud applications. And so you kind of look at the operation of your environment, you look at how you're, you're doing your development and your test, how you're going to take things into a CI, you know, a continuous integration, continuous in development type of environment. Um, a lot of your processes that you're using today don't really map well to an agile CI, CD type of framework. And so you have to rethink how you kind of go from development to, to unit tests to, you know, production and to, you know, quality of, you know, QA if you have a QA process in there somewhere, right? And so trying to figure out how you transition from the, the developer to the production side is a much more quick process today. It can take minutes instead of, you know, months like it used to take. And so looking at how your processes need to change to support that. And then from a technology standpoint, uh, a lot of things that are not thought about are sort of how that user experience would be and some of the orchestration pieces that are needed to really orchestrate your end-to-end -end service. How do you make sure that that service is highly available, or that that application, um, if something goes down that supports that application, that your application data can migrate seamlessly to another environment that keeps everything up and running for your users. The other thing that's kind of happening at the same time is everything's becoming more commodity and, and lower cost, right? Cost is a big factor for especially an OpenStack type of solution. And so you have to look at how does that impact your applications, how does that impact your, your time to market and your availability of your services. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of, um, a lot of the technology impacts are, are slow and take time to make changes. There's a lot of investment in existing infrastructure, existing um, components within that infrastructure that you can't just rip out and throw in brand new commodity gear. And so trying to look at how do you make that transition is important, right? And so part of the sense of urgency that, that Cisco had was, you know, cloud is basically changing IT as we know it. And so part of that is the perimeter is pretty much gone. Right, most of us are, 
using cloud in different ways today and, are, and probably don't even think about it as a cloud, right? Uh, most of us have mobile phones and we're doing things in the cloud all day long with those. Um, the data center is changing. It's not the same type of silos that you have today um, or it won't be in the future, right? If you're not changing the way you deploy data centers and manage data centers, you will be because it's completely different um, or it will be completely different in the next few years. The way that um, people want to consume information and consume an environment has changed to be more of a consumption model. People really just want to pay uh, for what they're using. They don't want to sign a long-term commitment anymore. And so when you're Cisco and you sell everything as a big box and you look at a you know, one to three year term typically, a consumption model is not something you really adopt very simply and easily, right? And so we had to kind of look at how does cloud change the way we need to be selling our services and our products. And then when we think about the software development lifecycle, um, as things have moved from, from waterfall to agile, um, DevOps and, and the, the likes of DevOps and capabilities around DevOps are becoming more and more prevalent in, in every environment. And so when you think about how that changes the way you're, you're developing your applications and using the environment, you have to kind of understand how those impacts are going to be on your organization. And then once you kind of kind of put this sense of urgency and get people sort of understanding why you need to do something different, you then have to kind of organize to be successful. Uh, part of that organization is, you know, in Cisco's case, we created a cloud board, and their main job was to sort of look at how does Cisco evolve from where we're at today with traditional applications that require services and, you know, six to nine months to turn up to, you know, software as a service type of, of solutions that just you deploy from a, an environment and it runs and turns out very quickly. There was an advisory board created um, to sort of look at how do we create this organization, how do we govern this organization. And then we wanted to, you have to kind of make sure that you're enabling the change agents within your organization to make that change because it is a big change and a big shift. And then lastly, once you do that, you want to innovate and allow that innovation and kind of sponsor innovation, if you will, so this small group of the cloud board sort of sponsored innovation across all of Cisco. Um, the second thing they did was they sort of identified some big strategic opportunities and they selected some strategic initiatives to kind of help get some quick wins and drive some quick successes. And so um, within Cisco, we took WebEx and have, have sort of made WebEx a cloud enabled solution today um, that's running on, on the Cisco cloud. We've um, worked with our partners in the telco space and in, um, in the ISV space and are creating partnerships and deploying services across partners in, in sort of this inter-cloud model. And then we you know, basically made a decision that we're going to move with agility and speed that Cisco hasn't had since the early days when they were a startup. And so we've kind of turned a corner now, and a lot of what we've been developing and what I'm sharing today, we are in a very agile, very quick deployment type of model where we're, we're releasing code every couple of weeks. Um, and our applications like WebEx make change, hundreds of changes a day, and no one even knows it. They're very agile inside this cloud environment. And then the last thing they did was they started recruiting, bringing people in that have built OpenStack clouds that understand applications running in OpenStack, um, that have worked in, in different environments in the Valley that understand the need for Agile and the need for developing with speed and agility. And then they started removing any barriers that came up from within some of the business units within Cisco. So that's sort of how you know, Cisco started that in the beginning, started to make this transformation and make this change. The application-centric piece came in from a standpoint of um, it's really about the application, right? And, and Cisco had a hard time kind of getting their mind around it's not about the network, it's really about the application. The network has to support and do things to help that application perform better and to, to get from point A to point B, but it's really about the application. And so um, part of what we tried to do was enable the innovation within the applications that were being developed and ported into our cloud within Cisco to give them the scale that an OpenStack cloud can provide and to give them the ability to innovate very quickly within that cloud. We started connecting our developers within Cisco to the different services that we can enable within the cloud. And what's really interesting, interesting about this process is that as our business units started working 
on our cloud, they started talking to each other about what they're doing in, the, in our cloud. And they started saying, oh, we could, if we, we all use this service, or if we just put this service in, into the Cisco cloud, we could all just leverage this service and not have to create it and maintain it ourselves. And so by kind of enabling your developers to think outside the box, they can start bringing ideas back into your, your organization to do better things for the developer community, which then turns into more ideas. So it's kind of a, it's a good practice to get into that. And then from an organization standpoint, we kind of have been looking at our customers and how do we help the IT departments of our customers you know, kind of transform into more of a business unit instead of a cost center. And so, you know, for, for a long time, IT has had this kind of um, perception about them that they're a cost center, that they're slow to change. And one of the things that we're trying to do is enable them to be thought of more as a business unit and not so much as a cost center. And then the last thing that we're doing is we're kind of creating this exchange of, of application marketplaces. And so um, it's, it's pretty clear that the one of the main use cases for cloud is obviously deploying quickly, leveraging existing applications where possible. And so one of the things that we've done is kind of provide this exchange of application marketplaces. There's a, a reference architecture that we just put out um, called CRA version one, customer reference architecture. And it kind of shows the different layers of you know, the Cisco um, cloud and services components. Um, it's based on you know Cisco UCS, Cisco networking, obviously, um, but it also integrates with our partners in the storage area. You can see NetApp and EMC there. It also integrates with um, some of our partners in the um, the orchestration layer. So we have you know both VMware and um, Canonical and Red Hat type of of um, partnerships. And we kind of break it down into different services layers, and then service management and the application. Um, the automation of these these cloud components underneath that. So that's kind of the the, the, the transition to being very customer, you know, being very application centric, right? Thinking more about the application. With that journey, we've kind of looked at what does Cisco do to support this application transformation within Cisco. Um, so what does a Cisco need to do to enable this? And so I, the first thing I kind of ask is why, why is there an inter-cloud? Why did we announce inter-cloud? And so the original goal with, with the cloud services team within Cisco was to kind of enable the Cisco business units to develop and take their traditional application approach and try to transform that into more of a cloud, either cloud native or at least cloud ready or cloud capable type of a SaaS model. But to accomplish that, we realized that, and this was realized you know, six months ago, that we had to build and operate a cloud to really understand how to enable applications in a cloud. And so part of that meant that we had to kind of look at a new consumption model that was evolving with cloud. And so um, if you think about the product business units within Cisco, they all have different ways that they like to sell and bring their applications to the market. And so we had to work very closely and understand kind of what are the consumption models of our, of our users and how are they buying applications and services from Cisco today. We then had to kind of talk with customers and understand how our customers are consuming services today and how they'd want to consume services in the future. And then we had to work with our partners to see how we can help bring them along this journey with us. And so at a very high level, the Cisco cloud strategy is, is kind of these four components where you have the, the existing enterprise um, private clouds. And many of these, these clouds over time may go away, but today they, we still have a lot of private clouds out there. Um, you have partner provided clouds, a lot of uh, Cisco powered clouds in the environment out there. There are different public clouds that are not necessarily powered by Cisco, but are still you know, used very heavily by consumers. And then there's a Cisco cloud services piece that, that we tried to build internally to help um, bridge the gap between where our customers and partners are at and where enterprises are at today and trying to move them into a cloud transformation. And so if you think about that enterprise uh, private cloud piece, you, know, you really have things like you know, the enterprise workloads and some big data capabilities that we wanted to provide to them. Um, there's a suite of collaboration and video services that Cisco runs that we want to try to make easy to consume within that enterprise private cloud space. As you go over to the Cisco partner powered clouds, 
you have you know different types of hosted exchange services. You have different types of infrastructure as a service and platform as a service players, um, and you have things like virtual desktop as a service and DR as a service being offered um, by different partners. On the, the Cisco cloud piece, obviously we wanted to try to bring a lot of our applications and services into this environment. So kind of bringing things like WebEx and Meraki and different security applications into the space. Um, we partner with, with SAP, so bringing like a HANA as a service and different types of, of um, Cisco um, NFB or network function virtualization components into this in environment. And then from a public cloud standpoint, we wanted to be able to kind of interconnect the, the partner, Cisco partner clouds, the Cisco cloud and enterprise private clouds to the, the public clouds that a lot of developers are already using and not trying to force developers or DevOps to move or change their process, but to just kind of interconnect all of this together. And that's kind of where this inter-cloud um, name came from, is we're not trying to replace clouds, we're just trying to interconnect them in a way that provides you know, security, uh, some network performance and network policies, and, and provides this inter-cloud fabric that allows workloads and applications to run in kind of a, a heterogeneous environment. So to kind of go down to the next level of detail, um, you know, this, this whole cloud in a box concept is what I've been kind of calling this, where, where Cisco is just providing sort of a black box to our partners and, and to our, our enterprise customers where they're able to kind of manage um, who they want to connect with through the federation components. They're able to get usage and billing data out for their tenants or for their, um, their businesses that are using this environment. And they're able to provide service assurance and we have the APIs underneath that that we're just exposing um, the different um, OpenStack components that I'll show you in a minute and being able to provide multi-tenancy and some of the network policy assurances and, and compute performance capabilities while at the same time um, providing commodity compute pricing for this service. So from a, an architecture framework standpoint, you know, we have this infrastructure component um, and the infrastructure component is, is very much like you saw in the customer reference architecture where you have, um, you know, the data center facilities could be um, any, any partner, any, any co-location spot or um, any Cisco data center that is running the Cisco cloud in it. Um, and it could be any, you know, enterprise data center. It doesn't, we're not forcing anyone to use a data center um, of any type. Uh, the network, the compute, and the storage obviously run better if they're Cisco solutions, and the Cisco cloud is built with the Cisco solutions, but we have partners that are providing the capabilities that plug into this as well. Um, above that are the services layer that are all open stack and all open source um, components. And so the, you know, a big key with all of this is we're, we're supporting you know, open source um, openly and outwardly at Cisco and not trying to bring proprietary protocols into this. Um, Above that is the APIC, which is our application policy control component for the um, application enabled infrastructure and policy management components that build into that. And the intercloud fabric obviously ties into that policy to allow you to kind of have control over where you move your workloads. The next layer up we call this unified platform and it has some of the infrastructure components, the, the kind of infrastructure orchestration and management components. It has some analytics pieces and it has a services platform. And so from a, a cloud standpoint, we kind of provide the fulfillment and the assurance monitoring pieces out of that, um, out of that unified platform. We provide um, brokerage capabilities to allow you to kind of select which partners you want to be able to broker with and connect to. There are um, some of the BSS components like billing and entitlement, and um, the service catalog sits in that layer. And then above that, we have this foundational PaaS environment that lets the developers connect their IDEs that they develop into, into this cloud environment. The next layer up is sort of the services platform piece that has some API management and API governance capabilities. It has some of the design runtime or PaaS runtime type of environments, uh, data as a service capabilities, some of the app integration, data virtualization pieces that are needed for doing big data analytics, and then some of the operational analytics to help run and, and operate the cloud more efficiently. And then the layer above that is sort of this app marketplace I alluded to earlier 
that allows applications from our partners to be inserted into our application catalog, and then our partners can select which applications they want to expose to their users and their tenants. And there's sort of this layer above this that I, I don't usually talk too much about, but it's important because um, a lot of um, a lot of our partners want this portal interface or this single pane of glass that lets their tenants kind of see all of their deployments across all of the different intercloud environments. And so being able to kind of provide a single interface that lets you see your private deployments, your public deployments, and your, um, your Cisco cloud deployments all from one control pane and create policies and, and manage your workloads from there is sort of the vision we went after with this. And then obviously above that you have the different applications that, that Cisco's developing that are running in this environment that our partner and ISVs are developing that run on top of this. And then over to the left you have you know, what you'd expect from Cisco, our services pillar, where we can provide different services from professional services to managed services to, to consulting services. So then, you know, when you kind of look at what's the service architecture, and this is sort of the, the piece that talks a little about OpenStack here. And so at the very bottom of this picture, you can kind of see the operations piece of the Cisco Cloud. We're providing, you know, within that black box is what this represents that I showed you earlier. So we're providing all of the, the monitoring, all the management, all the orchestration pieces. Um, we're exposing the heat um, APIs. You can create templates or import templates. Um, we allow you to integrate with, you know, Puppet or Chef or whatever your choice of, you know, orchestration tooling is. Um, on the right-hand side is sort of this, um, the physical environment, which again, I kind of mentioned the Cisco UCS um, B series for the compute layer and C series for the Ceph and, um, and object store layers. Um, above that infrastructure is where sort of the tenant VMs would be running as part of a, an isolated uh, network segment. Um, above that is sort of that, that infrastructure as a service platform that I was alluding to earlier that shows sort of the different OpenStack components that we're exposing and some of the services that are exposed out of that API gateway to the pieces that we talked about above that are sort of external consumable APIs that our customers and tenants can leverage. So then when you, when you, you know, the last piece of this was sort of what is, you know, Cisco doing with OpenStack? And so um, I think, you know, the first thing is that OpenStack has come a long way. For those of you who are in Portland last year and kind of saw half of the attendance that's here and the, um, you know, the marketplace out here was maybe a quarter of the size in Portland, right? You can see there's a lot more adoption going on, a lot more interest in OpenStack. But it still has a way to go. And as we started developing and, and building out the Cisco Cloud and deploying the Cisco Cloud, we started seeing some areas that needed some additional hardening. Um, and so some of the areas that we're working on are in performance improvements. And so two of the main areas there are identity management or keystone and the messaging uh, and message queue capabilities. So to make them more robust, um, to try to not have as many um, errors with authentication and to provide more um, um, options in terms of the types of data stores you can connect to. Icehouse has done a lot, um, and there's been a lot of con contributions um, in Icehouse, so Icehouse has done a lot to take us forward, but there's still more work to do um, that Icehouse still hasn't covered in, in the identity piece and messaging piece. The second area that we're contributing to is some of the metering improvements, and so um, there are some scaling issues we ran into with Solometer. Um, we wanted to look at different services that OpenStack exposes. We wanted to add those services to Solometer, and there were some limitations on what we could, could monitor within some of the service sensors. And then there's a, kind of a little bit of a, an open security bug in my mind of how you can allow, um, you know, you could, if you don't throttle, if there's not like an automatic throttling of events, you could actually overload, and we have overloaded <laughs> those, those um, API endpoints and kind of brought down this, the monitoring service because it, it got overloaded with events. Um, and then from a network improvement standpoint, um, we're, we're doing a lot of work um, today within Neutron and within um, um, both op and Open Daylight, which is a different, um, um, organization, but they're, they're, they're partnering with OpenStack and, and collaborating with OpenStack around application policy control and, and application enablement within the network layers and then IPv6 support within OpenStack. 
And then the, um, the last piece that is important is in order to really have high availability and run you know, your service at 100% uptime, there are a lot of things around the service assurance piece around um, you know, API heartbeats and checking the services and ensuring the services are highly available and up. And then um, some of the image management pieces, we ran into different sorts of um, weird corner cases with trying to support different types of images and different um, um, sizes of images being imported. And so with that, um, I want to thank you for your time and open up for questions. If you have questions, there are two mics up here. They asked us to use those mics um, for, the, for the questions. Okay, I guess I'll just ask one. Um, as far as the additional contributions to OpenStack, um, it, is there any, uh, I guess, not necessarily formal documentation, but is there any way where we, um, where we as a community can go to kind of view these contributions or, um, I guess I'll just stick with that. Yeah, there, there is. I, I can get you the location. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, thank you all for your time.